first of all, leadership absolutely starts with you. But guess what? It's not about you. All right, so a little bit of twist in the narrative. It starts with you. You have to do the inner work. You have to reflect. You have to name and claim your work in the world. You have to understand your values. You have to understand what is still true when the world gets crazy, when you're surrounded by confusion and even crisis. You have to learn how to not look for certainty, but for clarity based on who you are as a person. That is being a grounded talented person who can absolutely contribute to the world. But when it comes to leadership, unless you can say all of that is in service of, you're not really there yet. Do you get that? It starts with you, but it's not about you. It starts with you. It starts with your team. It starts with your mission. Absolutely. But it's in service of how you galvanize, inspire, motivate, provoke, evoke, all those verbs at a broader stage for the world. As a consultant and executive coach, this is what I get to do each day, each week. And I'm so inspired by the organizations that really get this. And they do both. They invest in their leaders. They take their values, their talents, their personal vision seriously but then they equip them in no uncertain terms how to spread that in a way that is absolutely mobilizing for something beyond them. So I wanna bring this home um, on both a personal level so that you can walk out of here today starting to make that bridge. Okay, it's not all about me, but I have to be in service, but I'm not supposed to be alone. Like where where was she going with this? Well, let's let's make this a little more um, tangible. All right? Everyone's heard about the great hero's journey, right? This has been throughout human civilization, the myth of the great hero leaving home, going into the unknown, facing the dragons and the, uh, you know, the trolls and the sirens to finally come home a transformed person, right? We, we know this. This is Every Star Wars, Harry Potter, Disney princess, there's some version of this. I'm here to challenge you to say it's not as important that you know your hero's journey. It's much more important that you know your cast of characters. No hero is on their own. If if a leader's out here without a follower, without a, a tribe, without a group, this is a guy out on a walk. Right? It's never just a person. It's always the magician, the companion, the trusted friend, the confidant, the truth teller, the devil's advocate. I want you to think about who are the cast of characters in your own life. And I don't want them to be the usual suspects. Of course, it could be a boss or a partner or a mentor. That's terrific. Make sure that those people know how much you appreciate the way that they're accompanying you on your personal journey. But I do want you to stretch a bit and start to think about some of the roles that I just named. Do do you have a truth teller? Do you have somebody that can really look at you and say, oh, with great compassion but great honesty, I think you're missing the mark. I don't think you're really being honest with your people. I don't think you're being brave enough. I think you're playing it small. Think about that person and invite them to be wildly brave with you. Do you have your magic makers, people that are very, very different, but when they show up to do their magic, your magic comes to life, right? These are complementary partners. You're very, very different. And given your own devices, you could be enemies. You could kind of resent each other. You know, she's so uptight. She's so flaky. You know, it it goes back and forth because we see it as opposites, Instead, if you say, oh, she's so free-spirited that she brings joy to my world. And she's so disciplined in structure that I actually have a world to put my feet down on. You know, think about that. Our greatest difference could be our enemy, or if we're willing to do the work, it could be our greatest magic for bringing all of our leadership together. So as you think about personally your cast of characters, it's a great place to start because it reminds you it's not all about you. 
It makes you name your verbs, how you're showing up in the world, what you're doing on your leadership journey. And it makes sure that you're part of a larger narrative. You're part of a greater adventure. I want to close by sharing with you a client that I've been with for many, many years, over 10 years. Um, it's the largest privately held company in the world. If they were publicly traded, it would be a Fortune 20 company. And they are doing work. Um, they're the most complex and broadly serving supply chain um, for agricultural products in the world. So I've journeyed with them in ways that we've rolled up our sleeves. We've gotten really honest as teams. We've had moments of truth with executives that have changed the way they've shown up with their people in more humane, honest, vulnerable, and compassionate ways. I was most struck with them when the Ukraine war started. Um, about 40% of the world's wheat comes from the Ukraine. So you can imagine if this is a company that is dedicated to nourishing the world, to getting food products where it needs to go to serve the greatest amount of humanity, and now they're dealing with a war zone where every single supply chain um, mechanism is breaking down. We may have been upset because they didn't have our favorite flavor of pop at the grocery store. We couldn't do things during COVID because of supply chain. This was just at a magnitude where it did come down to life or death. And I was able to see these leaders stand up in a way where they were not only smart, they weren't only competent, they hadn't only run the numbers. Again, that is no small feat. These are some of the most sophisticated economists and um, project managers and engineers in the world. But not only did they try so desperately to solve those problems, but they brought it about in a way where they acknowledged the human suffering that was happening within their organizations, within their plants, within their warehouses. And I can say this because I had a very unique front row seat to some of the heart, some of the courage, and some of the true willingness to be open-minded and open-hearted. And this is how that happened. I had already had a great relationship with this company. I knew the leaders, and I always say I don't have a dog in the fight, but I have skin in the game. You know, I kind of fall in love with the clients and the people that I work with because we're sharing the way we're changing our world. Now, eight years ago, our family went through a horrific tragedy. And it's something that, because it's eight years, I can share with it um, in a way that I couldn't in the early years. But eight years ago, our son Ben, who was nine at the time, tragically died one weekend. It was during a hockey tournament. It was something that was undiagnosed, asymptomatic, but he lost his airway, air supply. And as you can imagine, our entire world turned upside down. Now again, our path of heartbreak and healing and even hope is a story that I can share in another venue and another um, type of gathering. And it's one that during COVID, I did decide to share. I did a TEDx talk about why we need each other to survive and thrive during tragedy. During COVID, I had a reason to say, oh, not only am I sharing my leadership lessons, but how could I take something that's so profoundly transformational in my own life and not offer that as well. That took some courage to put that out there, to say I'm not a leadership expert here and a grieving mom here. Actually, my doing in the world, my weeping and celebrating and healing and growing and challenging, I had to bring all of those together. And I have to be honest, I'm not sure if it hadn't been COVID if I'd had the courage to put it out there in a very public way. But the fact is, our crises, our dark nights of the soul, the crucibles that we enter, are a deep, deep source of wisdom. Think about it, a crucible, this fiery heat, it does have the power to devastate us, to burn us to ashes, but it also has the power to transform us. Leaders, mothers, any person can enter the heat and be destroyed, 
and, it's not either or, you can be destroyed and you can be transformed. That's the true hero's journey. It's ultimately a leader's journey, maybe not in such dramatic and extreme circumstances, but certainly in ways that acknowledge the gains and losses, the pain and sorrow, the joys and the heartaches that are in this room, that are in your organization, that are in your teams. That's the human condition. When Hannah Rose first went back to school, she was in eighth grade at the time, and you know, eighth grade is a nightmare anyway. And then here we'd had this very um, devastating public tragedy, and the community rallied around us in ways that were absolutely profound. But still, this 14-year-old girl had to go to school that, you know, a couple weeks later. And the one thing I said to her is, I said, people are going to try to connect with you, and they may get it wrong. You know, they may say, like, oh, my dog died. I know how you feel. It, let's not judge. People are trying to connect. And there are heartaches in your school that you don't see. Everyone knew our tragedy. Um, it had been in the papers, the Minnesota Wild um, professional hockey team on the day of Ben's funeral celebrated him up on their jumbotron. They were incredibly compassionate and forthcoming in the way they supported our family. But many of our heartaches, in fact, I'd say most, are not things that we see. And this is why being a compassionate and a courageous leader matters, because we are all facing the human condition where we can live with joy and sorrow. So I want to go back to my client. And because we'd worked together a long time, they knew me and my family. They were heartbroken with us. And it took me quite a while to go back uh, to work. I shut down my practice for about six or seven months. And when I went back, although I'd been working with this organization for years, I'd never met the CEO. And so I was really having to dive deep and pull myself together. And I wore a really nice suit, and um, I did everything possible to make sure that I was going with my A game, you know, that I was still a um, smart, courageous, wise leadership consultant that could really help them with their mission. And sure enough, we had a wonderful meeting, and um, we covered our agenda. And as I got up to leave, my jacket kind of shifted up a bit. And I have a tattoo here that's a dragonfly, which is a symbol in many cultures for children who have passed away. And it's how their spirit kind of just nestles on that extra set of wings. And I'm a Broadway musical fan, so I said, you know, no day but today. Those of you that know, you know. Um, but I got to tell you, I grew up, you know, in Kentucky in the 80s. You know, tattoos were the gateway to drugs. So, you know, this was something kind of out there for me. You know, this professional leadership person. Dr. Annie didn't show up with ink, but I did. And so the CEO who is, you know, leading 165,000 employees around the world, he stands up and just very, you know, graciously and kind of just talking says, oh, oh, I see your tattoo. Everybody has a story. What's yours? Hmm. What do I do? I took a breath, and it was almost like this. I just, I literally kind of froze, and I decided to say, oh, this is in honor of our son, Ben. He died six months ago, and this just keeps him right at my pulse, right at my heart. And this CEO who was dealing with just issues of complexity and scope that I can't imagine, he immediately sat back down. And he didn't say anything. He didn't say, I'm sorry, or he didn't get embarrassed. He didn't try to, like, shuffle me out the door. He had the wherewithal and the presence to sit down. And he just looked at me and said, oh, your life will never be the same, will it? I said, no, it won't. Then I got up and we shook hands and I went on. It was a 40 second exchange, if that. But I felt seen. I didn't have to hide. I didn't have to make up some horrific lie, which would have been a dishonor to what I had experienced. He didn't have to solve my problem. He didn't have to hear all the details. 
But he created a moment. He created a presence that he didn't have to be a hero. He could be human. I didn't have to be a triumphant mom. I could just be a woman trying to make her way, still bringing her gifts to the world while holding great heartache. It was profound. A couple years later, when COVID hit, the CE calls me and he says, you know what? We have operations in India and we only have a 5% vaccination rate uh, right there. We have 900 managers who are struggling. Can you come and speak to them about what it means to be compassionate in the workplace? I got to do that. I got to speak to 900 managers in India who either had their own family members or certainly someone on their team that had faced this life or death uh, sorrow. This is in big corporate America. This isn't in a grief retreat somewhere you know, in private. Later on, we were able to institute a program at this um, company that's called Hope Works Here. And now whenever a manager, um, any kind of employee, not just a manager, whenever they would lose a child, and it happens about one in a thousand, but if you're one in a thousand, your world will never be the same. And so now what we do is when that person does come back to work after an extended bereavement stay, a grief counselor comes in. They meet with the team. They tell the story. They prepare the manager. They try to demystify grief so that that person is coming back into work that is meaningful with colleagues that get it, with the less anxiety of how can I be connected? How can I be close? So that's what courage looks like. That's what compassion looks like. That's why being smart enough, being competent enough, is not enough. Those are the table stakes. But if we are willing to change the way we think about leadership, if we're willing to challenge the myths and mistakes that we think it takes to really have power or have impact in the world, then we can create a difference we can be all in. We don't have to have different parts of ourself in private, um, different um, aspects of our mind and heart. We can bring those together because it does start with us, but it's not about us. It's about all of us changing the world. Thank you.